Hey kids, Peter Hudson from iHeart Guitar here, and thanks for tuning in or whatever to this latest episode. Um, today's episode is with Stuart Chatwood from the band The Tea Party. Um, and if you're not familiar with The Tea Party, they are a well, legendary to us Aussies Canadian band who, in the early days, they were kind of described as like if Led Zeppelin met the Doors. Uh, but there's a lot more to them than that. It's probably a good jumping off point um, to, you know, kind of check out their stuff with that in mind. But they they go a lot further than any kind of comparison like that. Really great band. And um, they are about to do an Australian tour, which um, they since they reunited a few years ago, they've played here a lot because... Australia really took to the band, and we um, we talk about that in the interview and how, um, you know, some bands just really catch on outside of their own territory, and, um, you know, it, it's kind of cool. Anyway, um, this is a really fun chat. I will put the... Uh, I'm putting the whole thing here um, just because it kind of gives it some context. The interviews were delayed a bit because Stuart was coming back from a show, and so they happened super late in the middle of the night. Um but anyway, um, I will put the tour dates in the show notes and um, just kind of drop you straight into this conversation. What the heck? Um, it was really cool to talk to him again, and I can't wait to see the guys live again because it's always a unique experience. Anyway, here we go. Stuart Chatwood from The Tea Party. Hey, this is Peter Hudson from I Heart Guitar. Is this Stuart? Hey, hey Peter, how's it going? Good. Is this the right time? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's one in the morning here, but that's okay. Oh, I'm man. Uh, Vancouver time. I just flew into Winnipeg, Canada, yeah. uh, Manitoba. So it's all good. Okay. This is good. Yeah, I, I saw, of course, that the uh, interviews had been delayed. Man, I'm sorry it's so late. <laughs> what time is it there for you? Uh, here it's uh, 4 p.m. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The top of four, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't worry. Uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm relatively sober. No. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so I was excited to get to talk to you because last time I interviewed you, um, I really enjoyed it because I think I only got like one question in, and your answer took oh. 15 minutes, <laughs> and I was like, "This is cool." <laughs> <laughs> well, everything's changed now. Oh. <laughs> um. Uh, far away. Yeah, so first thing we should talk about naturally is that you guys are about to tour Australia for what I believe is the 427th time? Uh, I like to count, actually. So, <laughs> not being a musician, of course, but mm-hmm. uh, I think it's number 19. Wow. I can believe that. That's Which is, yeah, it's just, I mean, we made the right decision to make Australia the first country outside Canada. We tried to conquer it. Mm. <laughs> It worked out so well, and just you know, from those early dates and those pub shows, and we just um, left a good impression with the Aussie pub crowds and the word spread. Um, and that's part of the reason for this tour. We're trying to recreate it with uh, going into some of these rooms that we've never been in. And, uh, where are you looking at? Are you in Sydney or Melbourne? Uh, or? I'm in Melbourne. I used to see you guys in Can- yeah. I used to see you guys in Canberra a lot because I went to university there. And uh, I see you're hitting, yeah. hitting Canberra on this tour. Yeah, so, I mean, we we stopped doing Canberra a few tours back, and, you know, it's nice to be able to return to there. But I think outside of uh, Melbourne, we're playing some Victorian... I don't know how big these towns are, so I don't want to say they're in the middle of nowhere, and then we get there. Mm. <laughs> but uh, the San Remo Hotel, like, I, I don't know where that is, but we're working with this new promoter and he seems to have a grasp on, you know, where our fans would like to see us. So, yeah. um, and uh, I think it's great for us to go back to these rooms because on our Canadian tour, uh, we're doing various sizes of rooms and we just did a 4,200 seat, uh, room in our hometown in Windsor with video screens and, you know, 300 moving lights. And it was the big concert experience and it was fun to do that but you don't really reach the people and you can't communicate effectively with the person in the back row, you know, in the back of the house. Mm. And you get this magic when you do like a thousand seats or, you know, whatever, you know, 800 to 1200 seats, let's say. And, um, you can, the crowd can see your face and feel your energy and feel your emotion and that they can 
give it back to you and you can feel the audience's emotion and uh, it's just those are the types of uh, scenarios that lead to magical evenings and uh, we're looking forward to, to doing that on this tour yeah well I've seen you guys enough times to know that every gig is unique in some way and you know and that the environment tends to influence it you know I've seen you guys play small places and huge places um, I remember okay. seeing a show in Canberra once where like Jeff's amp like it stopped working during the first song and <laughs> and you guys were just like yeah we're gonna fix this and we'll be back let's just chill and everyone was all like okay this is just part of the experience this is what makes this one unique <laughs> <laughs> was that at the university no that was at the Canberra theater oh the theater okay yeah okay I was just gonna say university crowds how <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> um now, one thing I've always thought is cool is that you guys, yeah, you're focused on the kind of pub, pubs and universities and stuff early on in Australia, but you also, according to me and all of my friends, have really kind of brought the, uh, the musician nerd crowd along with you too. Okay. So. Um, well, is... I will say thank you to that. <laughs> I mean, when we started the band, we wanted to make a band that we wanted to see live. Mm. And we didn't want to be the band that relied on gimmicks and uh, we did a tour in 1998 I think 1998 where the Foo Fighters and Green Day played before us Hmm. and the Foo Fighters uh, they were great players and they just went out and did their thing but then Green Day came out and every night they did the same shtick Hmm. where they pulled their pants down and had leopard underwear (laughs) and they pulled someone out from the crowd and then they lit their stuff on fire. It was like clockwork yeah. every single night. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the tour, the Foo Fighters uh, realized that MTV were there from the States to film the whole concert. And they did all the shtick that Green Day did before Green Day got on stage. <laughs> so we're all waiting in the wings. It's like, okay, so the Foo Fighters pulled their underwear down, got the person out from the crowd to play <laughs> along with them, and dropped the drum kit, lit it all on fire. And Green Day did the exact same thing. Oh, man. <laughs> so Green Day looked like the most unoriginal band in the world. And it was like, <laughs> I guess a certain level it becomes part of the show. Yeah. I know some other big bands with their pyro and they've got to stand in the same place every night. Mm. So you're really a circus performer at that point, I think. So yeah. I'm really happy that, you know, we've made musicianship, you know, uh, a priority in this band. I mean, not to the point of some of the, the prog rock bands where, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, it takes away from the song, you mm. know, and basically it's just, come watch a bunch of guys play 64th notes all night long. Yeah. It's like, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it was always about the song, but to, to be able to play well and uh, serve the song well, I think is, is important to us. Yeah. So I, I thank you for that compliment. So. So in terms of um, uh, music gear, equipment and stuff, what are you um, what are you excited by at the moment? Um, well, there's some great pedals, you know, and for me, I just upgraded my bass pedal board and I've got a, a thing called an Origin FX Cali 76. Mm-hmm. And basically, when you record bass in the studio, you throw it through an 1176 compressor and all of a sudden the bass just gives this growl and you know it's like oh that's the sound of famous bass records you know because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's, it's un- universally used of course but the bass that they shrunk the FET fat compressor down to a pedal and the pedal weighs quite a bit and it's about 500 bucks and so that means it's probably a thousand in Australia but <laughs> 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 but uh, it, it allows you to do parallel compressing and it allows you to do a little bit of uh, high pass filtering so the compression won't hit the bottom end as much mm-hmm. and I turned this thing on I, I, I bought it without hearing it actually because uh, nobody had it in stock so I had to take a risk and I turned it on and everyone was like oh my god your bass is so clear and, you know just the, the any staccatos or any stops you know it, it just made everything more defined mm. so of all the equipment that's something I'm very excited about yeah. Um, as always I've been playing my key pedals so I play bass and sing backups and then play key pedals for some songs mm-hmm. so um, that, that's always been a big part of our sound and just that's an unlimited 
sound source because it just is a MIDI trigger and it's just triggering sound in the computer, which I run main stage on the computer. It's been super reliable for me. Um, so, uh, and I, I'm typically running a contact sampler uh, on main stage and just building my own sample maps myself. So. Cool. Um, what is it with Canadians and uh, pedals like that? <laughs> you know, bass pedals. Um, I can um, think of you and Getty Lee. We're either too cheap or <laughs> too cheap, or uh, maybe we traveled in tour vehicles that only fit three band members, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think, or, or maybe there's an, you know, we wanted to create a bigger, bigger sound than just the three piece. Mm. So, and, you know, uh, I, I know Rush had keyboard parts on the records that Getty was covering with his feet. Mm. And, uh, Interesting fact, though, you might not know this, but we had the same managers as Rush for 20 years. Yeah. And we're friends with the guys in the band, and we've been to Getty's house a few times, and Alex's house a few times, but never Neil's house. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's a bit of a, a recluse from all, all, all stories got it. So we've yeah. only hung out with him once. So Yeah. But he, he's a guy that runs off stage. So. Mm-hmm. And I, <laughs> Interestingly enough, they've never played Australia, I think. Yeah, never. Um, it's, yeah, for the longest time, it was hard to even find their stuff here. You know, I, I don't know if you guys got this kind of thing in Canada too, but like there were some bands and stuff that we just didn't get. Like I'd never heard Freebird until I was in my twenties. I knew it was a joke that people always call out Freebird at a, at a gig, but it had like no, no traction in Australia. Don't stop believing. Never heard that song until it was on the, the Sopranos. Just wasn't a thing for us. Wow. Well, and it's the funniest thing is when American artists are huge in Australia mm. and not as big in America. I mean, Pink is now big in America, but she was never as big as she was in Australia. Yeah, my God. But, uh, you know, so- 17 arenas in a row or something. Yeah. It's- but uh, Jeff Buckley, for example, mm. Jeff Buckley, I could go down the street and interview 100 people and one person might know who Jeff Buckley is. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's because he died in the Mississippi, not because of his music. Yeah, but in Australia, I think his record might have gone top ten, or maybe even top five, or maybe number one. I don't know. It was huge. So, Faith No More, another band that, that you know. Uh, uh, I was just going to say that. Next. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but I was surprised they do have a following in South America. Faith No More, mm. and it was amazing because that video for Epic uh, it just traveled the world for them. You mm. know, that was the power of MTV back then, but. I think Australia might have been into Faith No More before the video. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, well, what I heard is that when um, Epic was a big hit in the States, you know, when it was getting traction in the States, they were actually touring Australia at the time and kind of missed out on the chance to really capitalize on it during those few weeks when it was, like, you know, everywhere. And so they just didn't, you know, take hold the way they did here. Like, here, my God. (laughs) Yeah, they're huge. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, it's for, I mean, and then there's the tea party. You know, we mean nothing in America. You know, mm. we're going to do some American shows on this tour to our select markets and mm. love us. And we played to over 2,000 people in Buffalo. And last summer we did 10,000 in Buffalo, New York. Yeah. But, you know, you go 60 miles down the road to Pennsylvania or to where we're at Pittsburgh. And, you know, it's like, okay, we're back in a club. And mm. there's 150 people here. <laughs> and they all, all drove down from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man, that stuff is so... Uh, yeah. So, it just varies, you know? Yeah. I mean, we're fortunate that we didn't tour Romania first after Canada. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 19 cool. tours of Romania. I'm only kidding. Romania is beautiful. What are we talking about here? <laughs> um, oh, that's almost our time up, so I'd better cram in a bass question. What are you, uh, what are you using at the moment? Um, I'm still using my 1970 jazz bass yeah. and I, I've used different basses I've used alembic basses and, which are beautiful instruments mm. just you know some of the most intimated instruments just every note on the neck is just perfect but um, my old standby is just playing I mean I'm playing maybe a little lighter now yeah. which is good <laughs> which everyone should be playing a little lighter but just part of my sound was to play heavier mm. and to, to, to uh, loud and proud and but, uh, the, the, the jazz knack is just more suitable for my playing and mm. just Jeff Martin will write these crazy guitar riffs and you'll be like okay now double it on bass with me I'm like okay good thing I have the jazz knack <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> do some serious stretching with uh, just a precision knack or something like that uh-huh. um, so I, I have two jazz precisions 
one's a, a 1970, and then the other one is probably in the 90s. Made in Japan was the other one. Yeah, 71 is obviously American. Mm-hmm. And um, I do have a Telecaster still, but I invested about $600 into my 74 left-handed Telecaster bass with double humbuckers, and it still sounds like a reggae bass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all it's good for is, you know, just flying Robbie covers or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So. Awesome. Well, that looks like our, our time up. So thanks for the chat. It's been great. And I can't wait to catch you guys in, in Melbourne. Okay. Thank you. Cool. And great. Great. Uh, have a good evening. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.